I don't even know how to spell well, it. Yeah. So, good morning. First of all, let me just, oh, it's the new pass The, um, I mean, we've been doing these round tables across the district since we started on that's of interest uh, to the constituents. And uh, I can tell you that uh, in, a, in every case, not only have we been informed uh, about how these issues apply to our district and our constituents, our people here, but um, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity to have ideas that we can bring back. And uh, we've been involved in legislation, co-sponsored, introduced legislation that directly came from uh, these sessions, um, I know on the vote on the uh, voting rights uh, issues. Uh, now there are the sixth is the anniversary of the Voting Rights Act, so we're a few days short of that. But um, you know, we've, we've every single bill I could find that I thought was prudent and wise that would get us to a place where uh, where Americans were, were were not unreasonably restricted from the right to vote is so critical. I know in the, um, in the Nebraska legislature, we spent a lot of time in 16 years I was there making sure that our, our voting uh, was fair and unrestricted. And, uh, there were, and, and I think we've, we've done that. And we're certainly heartened by the Fifth Circuit decision in Texas and the decision in North Dakota. I think there was one in North Carolina where what's happened in those states is what was predicted to happen <laughs> with the decision by the Supreme Court. And uh, it, it now it is time uh, for Congress to act. I know there, is, there are a couple specific things that I'm excited about. Paul Sarbanes, whose dad was in the Senate, is, is now in the House, uh, my colleague, and he has, I think, the bill I signed on the first couple days I was in the Congress, which deals with giving a tax credit for uh, small clinical donations to kind of even the playing field. Um, and his, well, Paul Jr., Paul the Congressman, has uh, voting rights is his number one priority issue. His dad as well in the Senate when he was there. Um, you know, we uh, were on the HR uh, res that deals with um, overturning uh, Citizens United. We co-signed that at the, at the beginning of my term there. Uh, a number of other bills. I think uh, also we're going through a period, obviously, in our politics where um, you know, groups of people in this country who have given their lives, whose families have given their lives and to this country are under threat. And um, you know, we saw that just recently with the Khan family. Um, it's indescribable uh, how someone in, in the position that of a, of a presidential candidate can make the kind of statements that are being made. And the problem not only are the statements and the, but what does that mean? What does that translate to as a matter of policy? And uh, we don't know. And that's, I think, what the fear is. I know every place I've gone, including Iceland, <laughs> Preston, <laughs> uh, every single person we may have talked to and conversed with to please you know, stop the demagoguery. We, we look up to America as an example of fairness and equality, and uh, this is not this is not helping. I know I know that when we uh, we were able to give a speech um, on the floor about the Tri Faith Initiative uh, a few months ago, that enabled us you know to sort of underline that our, what our community is trying to do has done continues to do to um, to deal with um, discrimination. And when that when that, when those sort of the, um, inflammatory statements are made, um, uh, it sort of is, becomes sort of almost a justification for policymakers to say, well, yeah, that's right. You know, let's restrict voting rights. Let's let's do what we do to um, to make sure that people we may not like today and it makes it harder for them to vote. Um, so that's it's it's a very important issue to me. I know when I, Chris Byler and I actually introduced the campaign finance law years ago in the legislature. He was a he was the principal introducer, but we worked on it. And that, that law, which uh, had restri restrictions on um, campaign money, uh, worked. Uh, and then the Supreme Court threw it out. So 
um, ever since I started working in this area um, or being involved in public life in the early 80s, there's been a steady sort of in the court system, um, I think it was Buckley versus Viejo in those cases subsequent to that, sort of there was an erosion of this, um, of the ability of legislatures to uh, make sure that people have the freedom to vote and the right to vote. And uh, it culminated, of course, in, in the Texas decision, the Supreme Court's decision in the Texas case. So, so um, uh, this is serious stuff, and I'm done talking. So let's go around the room. Maurice, if you want. Hi, I'm, I'm, just, I'm Maurice Jones. I'm a candidate for city council, and I'm looking to be more involved in uh, the community. So I don't really have anything to say. <laughs> well, you might. <laughs> uh, eventually, once we start formulating conversations. Good. Hi, I'm Lisa Sherman. I'm the HR Director for One More Community Health Center, and I am very passionate about this topic. I want to make sure that everyone is given the right to, to vote, and that there's no any kind of disparity in regards to our state's statistics showing if it's adversely impacting any protected groups. I'm Preston Love, Jr. Uh, I've been uh, in the arena of voter participation for now. 35 years. Uh, most of my uh, time in this area has been devoted to fighting for uh, better voter participation. Uh, I, this is my beloved uh, state and hometown, and uh, I have written a book, I write a column. All of my efforts are directed toward uh, higher voter participation in urban communities and in this particular case in Omaha, there is a residual that applies to all urban. I, I uh, when we get a chance to talk it through, but uh, I'm surely an advocate for this area and have been working uh, a good part of my life. 35 years is a small part of my life. I'm so old, but uh, for a long time, and so I'm very interested in you know, legislation. Hi, I'm Angie Remington. I'm the Communications Director for the Nebraska Civic Engagement Table. Um, we just launched in April of this year, and our mission is to make sure that all Nebraskans have their voices represented in the state, local, and federal government. So um, I'm here to just share ideas and hear about the issues and take them back to my team. Uh, my name is Omaid Sabi. I'm with uh, Nebraska Appleseed. We're a multi issue, multi strategy nonprofit uh, based out of uh, Lincoln. Uh, my name is Joseph, and I'm here as an independent journalist. Rebecca Valdez with the Urban League. Hi, Jonathan. And as you know, as we speak, um, the chief is in Baltimore at the National Urban League. Ur I urged him to attend this very meeting over there about voting rights. So since April, the Urban League uh, has launched an extensive campaign um, focusing on voter education, the importance of voting. You go to our website at www.urbanleague.com. Uh, Nebraska.org, you'll see. We're trying to get involved in, in as much advocacy as you know. We can't go on the other side because of our 50, you know, 501c, but we are actively, actively involved and pledge to do whatever we can. And we really want Warren to come to the corner of 30 and Lake and fill up that alley, the trolley. I think he probably and, will. And yeah. take, he usually does, but he says he's yeah, take people over there. But thank you for the invitation. I'm Ann Chelson. I'm the vice president with the Local League of Women Voters. And we were in Washington this last June talking to our federal senators and to your staff about uh, the re-up on the, voter, uh, the Voting Rights Act. And there is a bill before Congress right now, both in the Senate and in the House, and we were asking them to support that. Uh, I won't say that we got overwhelmed in support on the senatorial side, and your your assistant assured us that you were very much for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I am very much for it. Okay. I'm Chris Carruthers. I'm the Chief Deputy Election Commissioner for Douglas County. Uh, prior to that, I worked on campaigns and uh, was Executive Director for one of the major parties. And I also have done some work for some of the election uh, equipment companies. So that's my background in this area. Who did you, which election company? Oh, he has an Okay, yes. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> I fairly thought simple. You, I, I, don't, no, I, I thought you, you did. You know, Rosamond Todd was a Todd. Yes, yes. yes. Old friends, went to high school with them. Yeah. Hi, I'm 
Deb Davis. I am the Chief Deputy Election Commissioner for Sarkey County. Um, as of 2010, after 29 years in the banking world, I came to this position. Um, it has been a very wonderful learning process. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Um, prior to that, I had worked on campaigns when I was young and in Lincoln. Um, someone had said to me, uh, I didn't realize that you were a Democrat, and I said, <laughs> I am a closet Democrat in the state of Nebraska like a lot of people are. So. It, 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 you know, it's interesting on that point is that, uh, you know, in the legislature, um, when we did the um, campaign finance um, bill and then when we did the, uh, uh, the voter registration um, modernization mm -hmm. laws, I, I can't, I don't recall if there was, <laughs> there may have been some opposition but it was, you know, overwhelmingly bipartisan, and um, so it, it seems it seems to me like um, that it, it's both parties should want as many people to vote as humanly possible, as legally as they're, as if, if they're, they meet the, the criteria, and um, so um, and about our election commissioners' offices, it is incredible how well run they are and how uh, how I'm mean, honestly when we went through some of these these bills in the legislature I think as I recall that there was only one instance of voter fraud in the entire state history of the state of Nebraska and the in that case it was determined that there's something that, was, that person was found out I guess at some point in the process so uh, it's interesting yeah. hi <laughs> Uh, I'm Brianna Hardy. I'm the Director of Voting Rights with Nebraskans for Civic Reform. We're a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that does uh, voter modernization bills and policy as well as uh, voter advocacy and litigation when necessary. Yeah. I'm Jonathan Benjamin Alvarado. I'm the Assistant Vice Chancellor here at UNO, and I'm also the Interim Director of the Office of Latino Latin American Studies. And we've been running a nonpartisan get out the vote effort in the South Omaha community for 10 years now um, with community partners and youth from the community. So I'm very interested in continuing to pursue uh, those activities and hear what others have to say about it. Steve, there's a key back here. Oh, there's Christian. I had a key to the left. <laughs> uh, my name is Christian Espinosa. I have constituent services, uh, aid for Congressman Brad Ashford. And I will be your point of contact here in the district office. We have a, I have a counterpart in DC. Her name is Denise. Uh, she was caught up a little bit in the office right now. She has some things going on. No, I think I forgot to give her a ride. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody told me that I was yeah. supposed to. Right? <laughs> well, she has something that's yeah. good too. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so um, sort of to kick, how do I want to kick it off? I, I just, why is voter turnout in the United States so much lower than, than other, other countries? Europe, for example. There's a lot of apathy. Um, there's a lot of apathy that people don't believe that their vote makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And they feel that, you know, I mean, you hear a lot of the press um, talk about the system that's rigged or that, you know, if, if, uh, if there's so much money in it right now that people don't feel like their vote makes uh, any difference. The reality of it is, because this is what I study as a political scientist, is that all the money that, you know, the Bible, I mean, that the uh, our money, yeah, and it has put into the process doesn't produce any results. It's still the same thing that it's always been. It's face-to-face -face contact. It's knocking on doors. It's personal phone calls to get people to go to the polls. In spite of the belief that the Koch brothers can buy an election, their their money has bought nothing over the course of the last three election cycles. They have not been on the winning side of anything. So to me, that's a, a very sound kind of testimony against that perception on the part of, of the public. And one of the things we like to do with people, and I'm very grateful that uh, the, the League of Women Voters has put out so, many, so much good information in the past, we've taken a lot of that information and translated it into Spanish. So we have flyers that just basically say the five things you need to know on election day in Spanish and English. And we try to really facilitate the process by which we encourage people to go to the polls. You know, your voice, your vote is your voice. If you don't use it, you lose it. And we try to make an emphasis that everyone has, you know, if they're eligible to vote, they have that capacity and that responsibility. And so um, 
one of the things that we've noticed in the 10 years that we've been working in South Omaha, incrementally, we've continued to make um, you know, gains. It hasn't been as, and part of it is getting people used to the system. You have to socialize them into what the American electoral system is about. But I know in this, we had a phenomenal turnout in, in the primary in South Omaha, partly because there's a Latino candidate there. But I expect much the same with this presidential election, that uh, that, that group is coming to political maturity, if you like to say. And they're very conscious of the role that they can play. And so I'm going to continue to kind of advocate that only because, you know, in a very nonpartisan fashion, can't do it as a university. But the fact is that our job is to really engage the public to increase civic participation. And I think that we're there. I think that this community is well poised to to know that it will play a role in all of this. It's forward. interesting. It's interesting though. The, the the more money that's spent on campaigns, it, it seems to have no effect on voter turnout. It doesn't. So, so why is that? And then, and then my, uh, so is it? Does it have something to do with the second by second news cycle? I mean, do do that. This is it too much information. Price? Well, uh, on your last question, I, I think that the money that is spent on advertising is so global and so non-specific to the voter that it's put money in a funny kind of way, but it, it doesn't have the direct effect on the voter. If they see a great ad, uh, it doesn't kind of bring them out. If they're not inclined to come out. That's the, the easy answer, but it is really a big part. I want to comment also uh, on the other couple things that you asked. One, I think, uh, is, and I try to be brief, that the voting is turning out to be somewhat generational. Number one, if in my community, if you look at who's voting and who's not, the older uh, generation, and you could do this on about four or five different stratas, but they're voting much stronger than the younger. That ought to be uh, enlightening to someone, but it says that people have a better appreciation for voting the older people. And then the culprit for the younger ones, partly, is the fact that in our schools, I work with the League of Women Voters, and Anne can be my witness, mm -hmm. uh, the, the kids don't have a, a clue about civic education. Mm -hmm. And the schools have almost removed it as an item. And so we're not teaching, they're not experiencing civic education at all, and so what we're getting is the residual is bad, is that folks are not engaged. And then lastly, uh, uh, and each one of these could, I could talk an hour on, but lastly is there is, the, like that. <laughs> yeah, there is the element of poverty, uh, which I speak to from my community, and uh, they are not affected by advertising, they're not affected by pressing love, running around, talking about voting, nothing else. They are focused on surviving mm -hmm. and uh, they could care less because then they really can translate that this does not mean anything to my life. They're wrong, but that's what they think. So we've got, uh, unlike maybe in your community, we've got a, a lot of work to do. That's why Black Votes Matter is a big thing we're trying to use to somehow get the attention of our community because we are, we're losing them in terms of their, their uh, feeling that voting does make a difference, and that's a big challenge, and it's... I, I wonder, it's a, it's a, one other, um, let's say go here, and then I want to maybe drill down on how, how voting laws work here. A lot of the money that's spent in advertising is spent in negative advertising, and it's done specifically to drive down the vote of your opponent, which means if both sides are doing it, both sides are driving down the vote. Uh, we have a media that plays the game of both sides do it, and don't really give very specific or in-depth information on what the what the issues are and how they affect you and what's being said specifically about them. You know, they cover things in a headline but not with any depth at all. Um, and we also find that with uh, uh, gerrymandering of the districts, you can have a state that could overwhelmingly vote one way but because of the way the, the districts are gerrymandered, you end up sending more of the other party to Congress. That's it, yeah. And this has really happened this last. 
Well, actually, that happened with your congressional yeah. district in 2011, mm -hmm. where they reconfigured it and took the eastern part of Sarpy County mm -hmm. out of the district and sent and put, replaced it with the but western. We still fight hard for Bellevue. Well, we don't. <laughs> but, 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 but I would also argue, as, as a consequence, those people living in the eastern part of Bellevue, their, their, their issues are not being represented. They are not being fairly represented by the system. I mean, I went before the state legislature and I testified against that right. because I was, who, who was going to be displaced? It was going to be um, folks just out of the armed forces, predominantly Latino and black. Because that's who settles in East Bellevue. Going back to the president's point earlier about the lower voter turnout, the money in politics, I think we also have to look a little bit at the campaign operations themselves. Mm -hmm. With the kind of new micro-targeting, you're looking at likely voters, you're talking to just likely voters, so the, the money being poured into campaigns and to those peer to efforts are turning out likely voters. It's self, it's self, it's it's self, self yeah. 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 So we're not talking to new self. voters, and so that's where we honestly need more resources yeah. for the counties and where we need more partnerships between nonprofits. I, just, but I, I, I think that's right. I just want to uh, shout out to our friends in the press. They're, they're, uh, they're here today. <laughs> so so uh, I, I, do think to, I, do, I, I do think to the, to the point, uh, it's a great point. And I think there's a difference between, uh, you know, the CNN every second uh, soundbite over and over and over and over again. Um, headline news, you know, uh, you know Lost our cat or something, you know. It was, it was, it was. Uh, to, you know, my old Joe Jordan over here. Some of you remember Joe. He's not that old. Who? Joe, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Joe had a Sunday uh, Sunday show. I know that uh, our stations have uh, Sunday shows. I mean, I think I think um, we probably do a pretty good job at. It, but it's a great point that local media versus versus national media. But um, let, let's turn to. Well, I was like, just going to bring up something Preston touched on a little bit, but there's a an inverse interest in the voters in the the presidential election gets everyone excited to come me out november's our super bowl uh next year for the mayor's race we aren't going to have voters in trust me i understand that yeah what 20 percent yeah well that's what we had in the primary was we had better turnout at 21. yeah i mean it's just it's just amazing um and it, to your point it's the same to the point over here it's the same um you know, as a candidate, from my perspective, and I, I love to be able to serve. So the only way I get to do it is by running, obviously. And, but the um, um, the mayor's race, there probably is no race or no office that affects, on a day-to-day -day basis, what goes on in the community more than the mayor's office. And um, and why? Why? I, 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 it's a puzzle. I mean, twenty percent is to get from five or six candidates to two or whatever is just a, it's a, such a small number. I, um, can I throw out one other point, and that's the electoral college issue. Um, what I hear a lot, even people in Europe, when I was traveling there and talking about the American system, is it's not democratic, is it? Because in effect, the president is elected by the electoral college and not by the popular vote. So, in I mean, I think we're fortunate here. And again, when we when we did the the bill uh, on creating an electoral college by district, I mean, my thinking in voting for it was this is great. Every congressional district will be enfranchised, really. Get the, the, I mean, the only time a Democrat in my lifetime has been has won the Nebraska vote has been, I believe, I could be wrong, but I think it's 1964 when Linda Johnson beat Barry Goldwater and Barry Goldwater carried 44 states, or Johnson carried 44 states. Uh, but the, um, it, when, it, 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 so if in Nebraska, I mean, you live in, if it's winner takes all, you live in Nebraska for almost every election except for Lyndon Johnson. I mean, not, it's not that your vote doesn't count, but the likelihood that it'll have an impact on the outcome of the election is almost nil. But I mean, it's, I don't know if it's statistical analysis, we say, but it's very small. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's a disincentive to voting uh, or not, but I think it, it might be in Nebraska. Yeah. So much if I could just make a real quick comment on the, the finance before we get all the way down the... Because I want to find out also from the election commissioner people and, and the nonprofits what, 
how they see the laws here working and, and you know, what can we do to change it? Well, first of all, I think our law firm, you know, us and Maine are doing better than most. But on the finance, you're a really quick point on that in all due respect. And that is, I, uh, those of us who are on the ground working, trying to get the vote out, wish that more money was spent uh, with those of us. It, it's kind of almost like a trust. Who wants to give Preston Love some money to spend, you know? Or who wants to give your organization some money to spend? But, but we, we could use uh, some of your advertising dollars to do the work I knew this was going to be about yeah. impressive. Yes, <laughs> because the grassroots work is hard to do all the time without any money when so much money is being spent at the top. Yes. You know, I was very fortunate in 2006 to get a $60,000 grant from the Nebraska State um, right. Secretary of State's office um, to help promote nonpartisan voter outreach. Now, um, there were some people that were very um, disturbed that I focused the, the attention of that money on the South Omaha community, yeah. but to be real, realistic about it, I, I could have done the same thing in North Omaha yes. uh -huh. of promoting voter registration, of, of pre pre preparing materials to be distributed yes, to, you know, I mean, the best I could offer the students was pizza. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is that's, they went out and did canvassing mm -hmm. and I was able to cover the cost of that. Now, that funding dried up almost immediately after. I think it became a partisan issue that, well, if you're, fran if you're franchising unregistered voters, you're unfranchising blacks and Latinos, and the state legislature didn't, did not authorize funding moving forward. I think if that kind of funding was still available to, to go to youth, yeah. to go to individuals who've yes. never participated in the political process, it's a win-win proposition. More, more voters, more vibrant civic democracy. Mm -hmm more vibrant civic participation. And I was very disturbed when, the, when that funding dro dried up. Fortunately, we had ginned up enough excitement in the community with that activity that others have joined in and actually taken the lead and been able to go out as, uh, as nonprofits and get funding to promote the nonpartisan dimension of it, which I believe at the end of the day is the best thing for all of us. I mean, it's a, like I said, it's a win-win proposition. And that needs to happen more. Well, what, what goes on, what goes on what, from an election commission perspective, what do you see? What kind of questions are you asked? What, uh, how, how do you deal with uh, uh, ballots that are questioned, or uh, how, how, how does the process work? That's a general question. But it's, it's very involved. I mean, everything is written in state statute as to how we proceed, and we follow everything to the letter. Like, we will never have a board of debacle because we do not determine the intent on any ballot. That's spelled out in state statute. Uh, we, if there's a mark on the ballot or someone drops a pin and it makes a mark in an oval, we have to count that if we go back and look at the ballot and for some reason it's not counting it. If there's something marking that, the, the person who writes on their ballot that I'm not voting for any of these idiots, if he writes through the oval, <laughs> he's voted for that. <laughs> uh, but we, in the commission itself, we do everything we can to accept the ballot, and that's how the law is written: right. is how we can how we can qualify that vote to get counted. Right. Uh, we'll have sixty people on our internal staff. We have a permanent staff of about thirteen. We'll have sixty people on prior to and during the election when we're opening and counting the ballots. Every time a ballot is touched, it's touched by two people of opposing parties. Uh, everything is spelled out, uh, how we deal with it, how we pick up. When we pick up ballots from the drop boxes that we have around town, those are picked up by two people of opposing parties. Uh, everything is handled fairly above board. Anything that we can show people, we do. But state statute also says some things cannot be shown. We can't show anyone a ballot. If you come in as a candidate and want to watch their county, you get to stand at the glass door and watch some very boring people feed paper. <laughs> well, the people are probably not boring. The process. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the process is boring. Yeah. Some very tired election officials, like what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And, and this, I, everything is, in Tarpey County, is the same way. Uh, we're on a smaller statute, but we have, and um, we remake ballots. Um, I have a team of a resolution team that remakes ballots so that we know that those ballots are correct. Our machines won't count an X, 
so we have to go back and remake hmm. And it's a person of an opposite party that work as a resolution team. And we remake the ballot um, so that that X is counted as an oval so it can go through the counting hmm. machine and count. Huh. So that, that's all done. Um, we have a resolution things? team also. Oh, yeah, we've done. Yeah. Um, we probably have six. Yeah, time. and it's just the quant, the, you know, the size. We have two people that can handle. You know, it. I didn't know. I didn't know that actually. I didn't know that you uh, do that. Uh, well, there's also a provisional ballot for scared yes. alive people. Yes. Right. If someone moves, and in Nebraska, if you move within the county, you that's the only re-registration you can do that day. Is if you're a resident of the county previously registered somewhere else, you can change your address at the poll. And there are other things that, that trigger a provisional ballot, but there's a series of information you have to provide as to why you're voting provisionally. It could be that we sent a mailing out that says, do you really live there and you haven't responded to us, you prove to us you do, you get to vote, but that goes in a separate envelope. Those envelopes aren't counted until the Friday after the election. So if it's a really close election, they can make a difference. But every one of those provisional ballots is counted if it's at all possible. And, and we go through step by step, and we have people at nights and weekends. <laughs> and it's not over for us election day. There's a lot of moving parts, and they keep moving. Uh, there's a calendar of events on the Secretary of State's website of what we have to have by each day of the week after the election. And it's all spelled out by the legislature. We don't make anything up. We also have a very good Secretary of State who helps us get he, the right He is exceptional. Yeah, he really is. Yes. Yes. I mean, John Gale really is, a, is amazing. And another thing voters need to know is that um, it's no different than when you, when you move, you need to change your registration. It's no different than you changing your license plates, paying your taxes differently. Um, that should all be part of the process that you change your address. You need to vote where you live. Mm -hmm. So people won't be disenfranchised when they go to the polls and we have to move them to another precinct because they don't live in this precinct any longer. They have to vote where they live. So people need to um, kind of step up to the plate and pay just a little bit more of attention and make that part of your moving process that you change your voter registration at the same time. Um, and, and that's just an education process, but we try to get that out. Um, and the, and the league, and, oh yes, yes. No, go ahead, the league. No, no, I would go ahead. And, and with all due respect, back to Preston, you know, when you're dealing with, you know, your OVPD, lights are out, your gas is out, the last thing you're gonna think about is changing. And, and you're right, because when I was captain of the caucus in LD11, we had almost 200 people had to re-register in order for us to that day. Yeah, that and day. that's just LD11. Yes. 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 All right, so in the big scheme of things, yes. there is an issue. It's not a priority, Congressman. It's not. And so I just wanted to make. I mean, it's not a priority to do 